All right, I think we'll get underway. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Marquette University Law School, Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are joined by Congressman Reed Ribble. Representative Ribble is the uh, representative from the 8th Congressional District. That's in northeastern Wisconsin. Uh, he is going to be leaving Congress at the end of this term, and uh, he will be returning to the private sector. He is a businessman by trade and done a lot of work in the roofing industry, and will go back to something he knows and loves. Uh, but he's here today to talk about an issue that really hasn't been talked about all that much in this campaign election cycle. We're going to be talking about the nation's red ink, our debt. But we'll also be talking a little bit about Congressman Ribble's decision to leave Congress, sort of what he thinks about how we get things done in Washington or how we don't get things done. And we'll also talk a little bit about the presidential race. He's had some strong things to say from some time ago about this presidential race, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So won't you please welcome Congressman Reed Ribble to Marquette Wall School. Thanks, Mike. Good, Good to see you. Good to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming out today. This is the uh, second time Congressman Ribble has been here. And, um, and I wanted to begin today by talking about um, the nation's debt, because I, I think back in 2010, I did a debate here uh, with the Senate candidates, Russ Feingold and Ron Johnson, who are the Senate candidates again this year. And, uh, and we talked a fair amount about the debt and, uh, and sort of the challenges that this country faced. But we don't hear much about it in this election cycle. At least, I don't think we do. Are you hearing what needs to be said in this? this no, time? not at all. I, I'm, I'm actually a bit surprised, but the, the presidential campaign has turned into a bit of a carnival. And um, I think at, uh, at great harm to the American people that you have a right to have legitimate conversations about the, the topics that matter in this country. And uh, it's never going to get back to those topics until the American people demand that they go back and get on topic. And, and when you all get fed up enough to get them back on topic, they'll get back up on topic. And uh, the national debt is, uh, is a real threat to the future of this country. I see some young folks in here. And um, listen, you guys are right in the bullseye. I've got three right here. You guys are right in the bullseye because someone's going to pay it back. And um, I'm 60, probably not going to be me, but it might be you. It might be your kids. Someone's going to have to pay it back, and I wish we would talk more about it. And I, and I think you, you have to start with how, how did we get here? What happened that takes us there? Because the, the actual discretionary spending as a percent of our nation's GDP is lower than it was in 1963. So we've rolled the spending back on the discretionary side. And, and people say, well, what do you mean discretionary? It's an all spend. It doesn't Congress control the purse? Well, yeah, to a certain degree. But there are elements of our spending that are governed by law. So for example, there are things that are off budget where, where members of Congress don't really have any say in, it in the annual budgeting process because they're covered under a term called mandatory spending. That means at some point in the past, Congress passed a law and protects that spending. Let me give you some examples. We've made promises to our veterans. So the bulk of spending on our veterans through our VA system is off budget. We have a food stamp program, which is off budget. Uh, Medicaid is off budget. Medicare is off budget. Interest on the national debt, which is over $250 billion a year, is off budget. Social Security is off budget. These are all programs that, if you want to get them onto the budget, would require a change of law. Or if you want to stop the red ink in some of these big places, you have to change the program, which requires a change of law. So uh, I, I think one of the reasons why you may not hear so much about this, and we'll, we'll go into the specifics here in a moment, um, and, we, and we've heard the president say this. Uh, he says, if you look at where we were in 2009 and where we are today, the deficit, different word, the deficit right. has been trimmed by three quarters. Is that part of the reason why we're not having this conversation? People think somehow the crisis has disappeared. Sure. I think that's part of it. And, and, and the president's accurate in this regard. Uh, when I went into Congress in 2011, the annual deficits had run in excess, and the deficit is what you're spending beyond revenue each year. And those collective deficits become the national debt. 
And those deficits were in excess of a trillion dollars. Uh, in 2010, about 1.4 trillion. Today, it's a, a, a little over 450 billion dollars. Uh, and so as a percent of the nation's GDP, around 2%. And so you say, okay, that's a, that's a sustainable amount of money that you're spending over revenues. And so I think it has just kind of gone off the radar. But every year, if it continues to go up, the debt go up by 400 billion or 600 billion or a trillion dollars, you've got a real problem. I mean, interest alone is 200, 250 or 260 billion. That's a lot of money. Stop and think what could happen if we had that type of money to invest in infrastructure. We had that type of money to invest in, in research to cure Alzheimer's. If we had that type of money to reuse someplace else that actually made the, the, the American people's life better, made our economy grow faster, helped bring wages up. That's why this is such an important topic. So you said to, to some of the younger folks in the room that, you know, they'll, they'll be the ones ending up paying. The Congressional Bo Budget Office came out with a report in July of this year and, and basically said if we don't do anything um, in the not too distant future, we're going to see impacts on the economy, we're going to see um, serious challenges for this nation. Describe for us what we're likely to see if we don't do anything. Oh, well, I mean, I'll just use one example. I'll use the Social Security program, which, which has been one of the, the nation's best programs to pull seniors out of poverty. In 1937, 38, somewhere around there when the Social Security program was started, nearly 50% of seniors were living in poverty. Today, it's about 9% of seniors. And so there's been no program that's reduced senior poverty that, like Social Security. However, that, that trust fund there is scheduled to run out of money, to in essence go insolvent, where the only benefits that can be paid for Social Security are based on the revenues coming in, in 2033. Now that would mean an immediate reduction in benefits of about 21%. Now CBO says that it's going to go insolvent in 2029. So somewhere between 2029 and 2033 where the Social Security actuaries have it going insolvent, seniors are going to see this big reduction, or, or the Congress is more likely to then take money out of the general fund to continue to pay it, which will just explode the debt. And so uh, it becomes a systemic threat to the nation's economy to not deal with this. And, and this is really the result of an aging population, isn't it? Yes, that America's sir. aging. There's two things that are driving it demographically. Uh, you have an aging population and you have declining birth rates. So you will often hear people talk about the workforce participation <coughs> rates going down. Well, they're going down predominantly as a result of demographics. Roughly 10,000 seniors are retiring a day in this country, 10,000 a day. But our birth rates are now just slightly below replacement level. So we've, we've got a real, uh, if you start looking out into the future, a demographics cliff or crisis that's coming that if we don't prepare for, we're going to really have a problem. So let's talk about Social Security, um, because I think for younger folks, there is this belief that it probably won't be there for me and for people who are maybe in their 30s or 40s. They think it may not be there in the same way it is today. You introduced a plan, uh, along with a number of lawmakers, and you make, you're proud of the fact that it's a bipartisan plan, uh, to address the future of Social Security. It's called Save Our Social Security Act. Uh, what are the key pieces of that sure. legislation? Sure. The first thing uh, I would say when I started this whole, and I started this five years ago because I was on the House Budget Committee, the actuaries would come into hearings and say, listen, you're the only people that can fix this, so you guys need to fix it. And here's the problem, and here's the deficit. And when I came in, it, well, let me just give an example. Two years ago, the deficit was about $9.5 trillion. Today, it's $11.4 trillion. So the deficit in the Social Security Trust Fund is going up by about a trillion dollars a year. So we've got a real problem here that's going on. And uh, the first thing you must start with is you must ask yourself the political feasibility question. What is politically feasible to do? And if you don't start from a political feasibility posture, you're never going to get it. Because you, what this really means is I have to write a piece of legislation that Democrats and Republicans will dislike equally. <laughs> Uh, because the reality is, to fix an $11.4 trillion hole, you have to have revenue, which Republicans hate. They don't want to admit that you can actually raise the, the uh, uh, revenue that's coming into the program. And Democrats typically don't want to recognize that Americans are living longer. 
And so they're staying in the program longer, which stresses that program out because longevity in America, we've added two years of longevity every decade since 1930. And now that, that will flatten out at some point for sure. We just don't know when because we're not seeing much of an increase in maximum age, right? You get a little over 100 and that's about it. But we're seeing people who were dying in their 60s now living into their 80s and 90s. And so um, we're having people staying in that program longer. So I started political feasibility. I wanted then to have things that both Democrats and Republicans disagree on so they each could say, I gave up this. What you're trying to do ultimately is say, I don't want anybody to compromise their principles, but I want everybody to reach and seek out a principled compromise. So that's a long introduction to get you to the point. I raised the cap subject to taxation. Right now, the, the, the cap subject to taxation is set at $118,400 or so. Anything after that, you don't pay social after security that. tax. So in right? other words, if, uh, if you earn 50000 a year, you in essence pay a 100% uh, social security tax on your income. If you earn 300000 a year, you're paying social security tax on a third of your income. The reason it was done that way is because they wanted a, a regressive tax so they could justify a progressive payout. So lower income Americans receive a higher benefit in relation to their average income than high earning Americans do. And so if, the, if you just eliminate the cap, which some propose, all you do is, is put more money into those same rich people's pockets when they retire. And you end up with like a dog chasing its tail, never having a revenue and balanced situation. So even eliminating the cap and taxing millionaires and billionaires don't, won't solve the problem. And so what I did was I, I looked at what uh, happened in 1983 when Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan reached their compromise on Social Security. They were told by the actuaries, if you would establish the payroll cap at, at taxing 90% of all payrolls paid in the country and then index it there, you're going to be able to maintain the revenue stream that's necessary with these other criteria about when people can go into it and, and whatnot. They did set it at 90% of payrolls, but they never indexed it. It wasn't, well, let me put it this way, it wasn't indexed correctly. And so if you're a senior today and you're, you're living with your retirement benefits, it's likely that you paid a higher tax in relationship to your payroll than today's young workers pay because you were paying at 90% of payrolls and today's workers paying at 81%. So at the very time that we have more seniors going into the system, the taxes are actually lower today in equalized dollars than they were then. So my proposal was let's make it fair to current seniors by saying, no, we're gonna make younger workers pay at the same level you did. But let me tell you the impact of that. It will raise the, the cap subject to, to payroll tax to $309,000 over the next six years. But that would then equalize it. And then if you index it to that benchmark at 90% of all payrolls in the country, you can stabilize the revenue stream. That fixes about 35% of the problem. So I now have a 35% fix for a 100% problem. And I'll ask you about other parts of the fix. But I do want to jump in here and say, OK, you're a Republican. You've just proposed something that would essentially raise taxes on a fair number of people. 5.5% uh, how... of the population. Yep. And do you think that's uh, something that would be amenable to members of your own party? How many, is anybody here in uh, Social Security age right now? Okay, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> for me to be fair to you, for me to be fair to the, the taxes that you paid during your working life, I must be willing to pay the same taxes that you paid. And if I don't offer that, then it is patently unfair to you. So we must equalize this tax so that every generation of Americans is assured that it will be there when they get there because then they're less objective to having the tax withheld. And so that would be my argument. And it goes into a trust fund that ultimately gets returned back to the taxpayer. So I don't necessarily view it as a tax increase. It's a, this, is a, this is a nationwide pension plan is what it is. So you said that would handle about 35% of it. Another part of your plan is raising the age. Uh, where you're eligible for yes. Social Security. You mentioned that we're living longer. Mm -hmm. Your proposal reflects yeah. that. Yeah, my proposal reflects that. However, uh, the way you worded it isn't actually totally accurate. What I said is you, I, I'm willing to raise the age 
of the full retirement. There are two, or th mm. actually three. There's sure. early retirement, full retirement, maximum retirement. And I know that this can get it confusing. But you can enter into the Social Security system at age 62. I don't touch that early entry point at all. So if you're in a, if you're in a tough job, like, for example, I spent 35 years as a roofing contractor, and the guys that work for me, their bodies typically wear up by that time, and quite frankly, you wouldn't want this person coming to your home or business if they're 70 years old and working on a roof. Their balance isn't as well, their, their back's not as strong, and, and their bodies have worn out. And so we have to leave that hardship entry place for someone to get in earlier when they do these types of jobs that our society needs. But for those of us who live a more sedentary lifestyle and are healthy and able to work longer, I gradually raised the, the full retirement age from 67 to 69. However, I don't start that till 2022, and I phase it in over 12 years so that younger workers have time to prepare. So it wouldn't be that you couldn't retire at 62 or 65. You could, but since you're going to be receiving a benefit for more years, your benefit would be reduced proportionately, but you've got time to prepare and save and put money aside to make up the gap. So we, we phase this in over time. We delay its implementation so people have time to adjust. And then we also raise the maximum retirement age from 70 to 72 in the same manner. Essentially, in 2022, we begin raising the full and maximum ages two months a year of eligibility every year for 12 years. Mm -hmm. What else is part of this plan? Yeah. The, then the third thing is we looked at the COLA. A lot, of, a lot of seniors are upset about the COLA that they're receiving, or in this case, maybe not receiving because they haven't gone up. And, and I would say that the reason is, is that the COLA was never based on what senior citizens purchase. The COLA is based on CPIW, which is the Consumer Price Index attached to wages. I would propose to any senior citizen today that there is no correlation to what you must purchase and what a 40-year-old's wage increase has been. Now, you'll wonder why there hasn't been uh, much of a COLA the last few years. Well, it's because there hasn't been much wage increases in the last few years. And, and so even though your cost of living has gone up, your, your COLA hasn't gone up because it was never assigned the, in the right way. We should do it on CPIU, the universal inflation rate in this country, so that you can, you can actually have a COLA that aligns itself more closely to what seniors must buy. And, and so I make that change. And then the, the, the next change I, I make is in relationship to how many years we're going to use to calculate your benefit. Right now, your, your benefit is calculated over your 35 years of work experience. If we were to move the age up to 69, we should also move up the number of years we average your, your uh, benefit by. So my plan moves it to 38 years. What that does is it... Uh, will reduce your benefit just slightly for younger workers. Sorry, that's your part of the deal. Um, in, in that we're going to look at 38 years, which means three more years of work experience at the front end of your career, which will pull your benefit down just slightly, about $2 a month. But what that $2 a month does then for us is I can take that savings that's there and redirect it to senior citizens living in poverty and make the minimum benefit to 125% of poverty, guaranteeing that no senior in this country will retire in poverty if they work 20 years or more in their life. Reducing senior poverty by 50%. And then I also say that because Americans are living longer, we're going to do a bump up in benefit for those that are very aged. So if you've lived 20 years in your retirement, we're going to bump that up because that is typically widows, not universally, but typically widows, whose benefit now is attached to their husband's work experience from 50 years prior. They've now lived so long that they've burned through their own private savings and are now forced into a posture of poverty. And so we pull that benefit up as well. And so that, that's the gist of my plan. The Social Security actuaries have taken this plan and have, have um, put it into their scoring. It scores 100%, 100.07% sustainable for 75 years. Every single American will be better off under, under my plan than the current schedule. Do we have the political will uh, to do what of you proposed? Not. Of course, course not. not. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because this would, this would take 
This would take Republicans of goodwill and reason to say, I'm willing to have that, that cap tax go up. Now, that's about a $4 trillion tax increase. And it's going to take Democrats of goodwill to say, you know what, I recognize that people are living longer. And we're going to have to move the age up. We're just going to have to do it. And we have to do this in a way that protects the poorest among us. And at this point, those two sides aren't willing to come to that agreement yet. And so ultimately, it's going to take a president of the United States that is willing to actually say no to everybody and say, we're going to have a plan that will meet the needs of all 330 million Americans with all 330 million Americans participating in its reform. Now, that's my plan. You might have other plans. You might have other ideas. And, and I think these ideas need to be on the table. They need to be talked about and vetted. Um, I, I drafted this because I believed it was the most politically feasible path forward. And, and left, groups left and right that focus on the debt have come out and endorsed the plan. And then a shock of all shocks, about a month and a half ago, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce came out and endorsed this plan, even with that $4 trillion tax increase, which is an astounding change. So it shows how serious people are finally getting about this issue. And uh, hopefully, I, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, this is what it's going to look like at some point whenever they reach their compromise. It's going to be this or some variation of this. I was going to say, how, how do you move people who are so dug in? Because you will hear Democrats, uh, when I talk to Democrats about Social Security, not only do they not want to see the age go up, um, but they, they just do not want it touched. They think it is uh, something that's basically sacred in our, in our democracy. Uh, and yet when I talk to Republicans, um, they have their own concerns about whether, you know, in order to pay for the growing needs in the future, whether they can bump up some of these taxes. I mean, people are really dug in on this. They, they are, but they're less dug in than you might imagine. They're more dug in in an election year. You might solve this problem much faster if we had congressional elections four years apart rather than two. But um, they, they get dug in in election years because they're more interested in kind of pandering to specific interest groups in their base as opposed to pandering to their grandchildren. Now, I, I want to make sure that my, my two sons who are in their 30s, that the taxes that are being withheld from their checks today, that that benefit is there for them. But I also want to make sure that it's there for my grandchildren. And so if I have to work two years longer, well, so be it. Then I'll work two years longer. I'm 60 years old today. I'm in good health. I enjoy my work. I want to work. Um, but I could retire at age 62 if I, if I wanted to. I would just have to take a lower benefit like the, the current law states. But in 2033, then my own Social Security benefit would drop by 21% if there's no fix. And so it is irresponsible for members of Congress not to have this conversation with the American people. <coughs> And in this room, right in this room, we've got, we've got citizens who represent left and right and probably the entire spectrum of, a, of American political understanding and ideologies. And um, it starts in, in places like this, where people are having honest, not passionate but, or, or angry conversations, but thoughtful conversations about can we find a principled compromise where we all give a little bit to make sure that our children and grandchildren have the same types of things and opportunities that we have. And that's all I'm asking. So if we did address Social Security, what kind of uh, fiscal path would that put us on for the oh, future? Well, well it, it, you, you would see that the element of debt on the out years <clears throat> drops dramatically because Social Security is the biggest entitlement program we have. I know people hate if you hate when Congress uses the word entitlement because it sounds like, oh, it's a welfare program. It's an entitlement program because you are entitled to it. That's what entitled means. You paid into it, so therefore you're entitled to it. And so you have to fix this to have any hope of fixing anything else. And if you can do this because it is strictly actuarial mathematics, it might give you then a place whereby you can begin to have the bigger conversation about Medicare, which is even in more trouble. That trust fund goes insolvent in 2024. But it's a much more complicated fix, in part because it's been wrapped up in the politics of Obamacare and our health care system. Um, this sort of leads me to, to a, a, I think, a natural segue here, and that is to talk about 
your reflections on the six years you will have spent in Congress. Uh, you know, we're talking about what you believe to be a real fix for a serious problem. Um, you were part of the Problem Solvers mm -hmm. Caucus on Washington, on Capitol Hill. Um, how would you describe your experience? Has it been uh, something that you will look back on very fondly and say those were good days, or is it something other than that? Um, it, this has not been the funnest thing I've ever done. Uh, I, I, so I, I, wouldn't, I would never describe the work that I do as enjoyable or fun. In fact, that doesn't even enter in the equation. However, it is important work. Um, but we have to recognize that we live in a divided country, that the separation between left and right has gotten broader. And the loudest voices in the, in the country are the ones furthest to the perimeters of their political ideology. And so when I hear voices in my congressional district, they're in the middle, the, those folks who hold a more centrist view just in, in politics, those voices are relatively quiet. And as you start to go to the perimeters, the volume starts to go up like this. And so I have very loud voices from the left and very loud voices from the right in my ear. But they're small segments of the American public. Most people want to get up, go to work, watch their kids play soccer or whatever sport they play. They want to see them do well in school. They want to have a, a promotion at work. They want to go on vacation. And they want, they want me to take care of the political stuff. We sent you there. We're paying you to do it. You figure out the best thing, get all the information, and vote for it. And that's the typical constituent. But there are those that are very, very passionate about these issues, and they're very strong voices and advocates, but they're generally not the more pragmatic center, left center, right folks. You told a story when you were here with Mark Pocan, who is a Democrat from the Madison area, someone who's become a friend of yours over time. Uh, the two of you don't agree on a, on a fair number of things, but you, you told this story of of going to Washington and being introduced to the ways of Washington. And you were stunned by how little interaction was encouraged between members of the respective parties. No, no, not little, zero. There's no interaction. I actually thought, I was on, I was, uh, when I first went to Congress, I was put on three committees, the Budget Committee, the Agriculture Committee. I live in a big agricultural district in Northeast Wisconsin. And I was put on the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. I actually thought, being the naive citizen legislator that I was, that when you had a, a budget committee meeting, that all the members of the budget committee, left and right, would come together, and you'd have a conversation on the dais there about what's going on, and you would begin to negotiate what the budget of the United States looked like, not how it works. Republicans go into their room. Democrats go into their room. Because Republicans are in the majority right now, just reverses when Democrats are in the majority. It's the same thing. Republicans get to write the budget and then force the Democrats to either vote no or vote yes, but they don't have a say in it. They have no say in it whatsoever. And they, they then go to a markup, and amendments are offered, of which both sides can offer an amendment. But I can tell you, in my four years on the Budget Committee, I didn't see... I don't think a single amendment that was designed to improve the budget, it was designed just to make a member take a hard vote that they could use in a political ad later. And so I'm into this about six months, and I'm sitting down with a very good friend of mine. His name is Scott Rigel from Virginia, too. Scott's a car dealer. He had never served in Congress before. He was a business guy like I was, has grandchildren. His dad was a Marine. My dad was a Marine. We had all this stuff in common. And I said to him, Scott, have, have you met any Democrats yet? And he goes, oh, no, haven't met any. And I said, me neither. And we're sitting on the floor of the House, 435 members of Congress. Now. I said, tell you what, why don't you go over there, just pick one, anyone. <laughs> and I'll go over there and I'll pick one. And let's invite them out to dinner. And let's just go out to dinner and get them to meet somebody. And let's see if we can find, try to understand this language of liberalism that they speak, because we speak the language of conservatism. And I'd like to know why they think the way they think. And so we did that. And uh, I invited Jim Cooper from Tennessee. He invited Kurt Schrader from Oregon, and we went out to dinner. And we had the time of our life. But you know what we talked about? Tell me about your family. Tell me about your kids. Tell me about the future. Tell me about your goals. How did you get to Congress? Why did you run for Congress? And we started to build friendships. And so we left that meeting. We said, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, each of you two Democrats, you find another Republican. And these two Republicans, Scott and I, will go invite two more Democrats. 
And let's do this again. Next month, we had eight. We ultimately had this at 100 people. We had to move into an actual meeting room in the, in the, in the house office buildings because the meeting was so large. And, and you know what happened? We didn't invite the media. Media couldn't come in. It was just members of Congress, and we actually began to talk to each other. Now, I, I agreed to chair that group along with Kurt Schrader for two, for two years, and then we moved on to other chairmen to do it. And, and I will tell you, some of the best conversations I've had have been in those meetings, however. I did discover something. It was easy to find agreement in private. I could get people to agree on my Social Security bill in private. Some of the most progressive members in the Congress, some of the most conservative Tea Party people in the Congress agrees with me on my Social Security bill. So I wrote it. But they wouldn't co-sponsor it. No, oh, I can't do that in public. You know, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is what it's going to be, you know. And... Um, that's my experience. Did that play a role in your decision to leave after oh, six years? No, not no. at all. No. You were just ready to return to yeah. private life. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe deeply in term limits. I just do. Not everybody does. You know, a lot, of, a lot of folks would say, well, you are term limited. Every two years, if the voters don't send you back, you're term limited. You don't need to do that on your own. And, and that's all true. But the system's rigged. The system is rigged in favor of incumbents. And, and so unless men and women of good will will voluntarily step aside, and let someone else run, you could be there forever. And, and that experience helps. I think I'm a better legislator today than I was when I came in. But you need this new sense of urgency, these new ideas, uh, this, this new attitude has to come in because it refreshes the place. And people say, well, if you do that, then, then the, the, the staff, the paid staff, the paid bureaucrats in Congress will take over. Well, when I leave, my whole team leaves. They're, they all lose a job on December 31st. And so they may land with somebody else. They might go back in the private sector. I don't know where they're going to end up going. But the whole thing churns by doing that. And I just think we end up with a better government when we do that. But it's, it, it's rare, and I realize it's rare that people will voluntarily step down because the experience mm -hmm. is heady. Mm -hmm. you know, it's nice when people call me congressman. You kind of feel, oh, yeah, OK, maybe I'm important. Then you begin to realize that you're not important at all. That you, want, you want to know what's important in this equation? You're important. We have the whole thing somehow topsy-turvy. And it's in part because of media and television and everything. There's a certain level of fame. But the, the only thing that really matters in our whole democracy is you. You're it. We, we shouldn't matter at all. All we should be is the mouthpiece for you. We should go to Washington, D.C. and tell the people there, this is what the citizens of Northeast Wisconsin, my congressional district, believe about this or that. And that's what representative government looks like. And so that's what I've done. I want to take about 10 minutes here and talk about the presidential race because... Uh, Do we have to? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely have to. It'll be fun, I guarantee. <laughs> um, so uh, you were one of the first people, if not the first people in Congress. For what? To say that you would not support Donald Trump. You yeah. would not vote for Donald Trump. Well, I was the first Republican. There first were plenty Republican. of Democrats that were saying that. Right. right. <laughs> I should be more specific. Yeah, there are probably a couple who were saying that, yeah. Um, so that was months and months ago when you September said last year. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of what you've seen? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed. I, I uh, and I, I, this, I mean no offense to anybody for the candidate that you're supporting, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. I personally do not believe either of these people are qualified. I just don't. And if I, were, if I were looking to hire a CEO for an economy of this size, I wouldn't hire either of these two. And I've got, I've got lots and lots of problems with the veracity of both of them. And, um, uh, and, and I have to, I, just so you get to know me a little bit better, I, I am the son of a Southern Baptist minister here in northern Wisconsin. I have five older brothers. Three of them are pastors. I went to divinity school. And I'm not a moral relativist. I'm just not. I'm sorry. I'm not. And, and these issues of truthfulness and integrity, those things matter deeply to me as a person. And so I struggle with this, uh, with the choices that we're facing. And, I, and by the way, many Americans are disappointed. All the polling shows it. You've been uh, critical of the tone of the campaign, yeah. too. Yeah, it, it, are you embarrassed by the tone? I am. Of course I am. 
Here, here's, here's what I've known. I'm, my, my wife and I have been married for 40 years, 41 years now. And, and I will tell you that any single time we have some dispute, when it, is, when it degrades to name-calling and anger, all that happens is we put another block in a wall between us. And every time that happens, another block goes up. And over time, that block wall gets hardened, where the only way you can fix it is with a sledgehammer. And my personal preference in human relationships and endeavors is to never, never say things that put the wall there in the first place. And so I, I have rejected wholeheartedly, both in my own political campaigns and virtually anybody who asks me my opinion, the idea that we must demonize an opponent rather than talking about what we believe and what our solutions are. Because if we want to move the country forward, and if, if, if you and I disagree, ma'am, or you and I disagree, sir, the only way we can have an honest conversation is if we respect each other enough that we can actually sit down and have an honest conversation. That there's enough trust and respect and honor and dignity there that you can actually deal with the big issues of the day. Because you can't find compromise. I mean, it was so difficult when I first got into office because you came out of this campaign environment that was so vitriolic that everybody hated each other right from day one. It took six months for just the temperature to go down. And so let's not raise the temperature to begin with. Let's just, let, let's, let's stop name calling, let's stop demonizing, let's stop yelling and shouting, and, and let's just show some mutual respect for one another because you, you and you and you, all of you are as important and more important than any elected official. So let, let's take the temperature down. I, 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 just, I think civil discourse in this country is a disaster. And I think it's bad for the republic. And most importantly, it's bad for my grandchildren. I don't want them to watch it. Do you have a problem watching, having them watch the debates right now? Um, I, uh, my grandchildren live in Tennessee, so thank goodness I, uh, um, I don't have to be there if they are watching it. Uh, I would hope that I, um, my sons are raising my grandchildren right that they were watching the Packer game Sunday night. <laughs> um, but um, Are we witnessing a, a fundamental shift in the Republican Party, your party? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think what you're seeing, and, and there's historical precedence for these things, um, I think you're seeing a populist wing of the party emerge. It's relatively large in that 20 to 25 percent of the party that actually actually joins or locks hands with uh, many progressives on issues of trade, for example. Um, and and uh, they found a common bond or a common enemy because politics <clears throat> is never about the solution. It's about the villain. And so we talk about trade. We need to find a villain, right? And so they find a villain. And it's China or whoever. They find the villain. And I think progress moving forward is not about the villain. It's about the solution. And, and so if we want to have a truly progressive society, we must have one that is solution-oriented. And so I do see that uh, there's these factions developing in the Republican Party that haven't existed on the surface before. The Democrats have had to deal with this for a long time, quite frankly. They've, they've got very, very progressive. I mean, just look at the Bernie Sanders wing of the party, which would lean toward a socialist type of uh, ideology compared to um, where, where uh, Vice President nominee Tim Kaine is at, the very centrist Democrat. Give, give me a, a general sense of your concerns about this election cycle for your party. Are you concerned uh, about uh, the fortunes of your party in this election? Sure, sure. I'm concerned about any, I mean, and anybody looks at, uh, you, you do get concerned about what we'll call down-ballot drag. You know, if your nominee kind of fights it to a tie or is close, there's very little impact on down-ballot races. If it's a blowout, like... Uh, uh, happened with Ronald Reagan, for example. You can you can actually set the table to swing a Congress, and and so it's a it's a fascinating dynamic as you watch what's going on and how it will affect Senate and House races down ballot. I don't know that impact because we've never really, as Republicans, had a candidate like Donald Trump at all. I, I don't know that in in the American political scene there's ever been a candidate that's been quite like him. Uh, very authoritarian in his uh, approach, but draws large, large crowds of very passionate voters. 
And Republican candidates today have to make a determination if they, if they say, you know what, I can't support Trump at all, they risk losing their base. If they get too close to Trump, they risk losing independent voters, which decide elections in this country. So it's a very difficult quandary for them. It's a tough position for a good friend of yours, uh, Speaker Ryan, isn't it? Yeah, especially Paul, uh, because he, his, his responsibility, and I think a lot of what was said about the conference call that took place yesterday was a mischaracterization. Paul Ryan basically expressed to the conference that he's going to continue doing what he's been doing. He said, I will not defend the indefensible. It's a direct quote from that comments call. I will not defend the indefensible. He did not say, I will not defend Donald Trump or his policies. He said, I will not defend the indefensible. And I don't think anybody should be asked to defend the indefensible. And then he said, I'm going to do what speakers have done for decades in this country. I'm going to focus on the, the uh, members that I'm here as speaker, I'm going to focus on House Republicans in doing the best I can to support them up in their reelections, which is what John Boehner did, which is what Nancy Pelosi did. You didn't see Nancy Pelosi out running around the country with Barack Obama. You didn't see John Boehner running around the country with Mitt Romney. And so nobody should be surprised when they don't see Paul Ryan running around the country with Donald Trump. He's, these, these people are in, in charge of a separate and equal branch of the government. They're responsible for the legislative branch, which in, which in many cases in a properly functioning government is in tension with the executive branch, even of your own party sometimes. And so. So we have fewer than 30 days left. What's your, uh, what's your, uh, your take on this, this election? And, and maybe, uh, maybe your fear as a Republican. What's your greatest fear? I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I choose not to live in a realm of fear. I live in the greatest country in the world, and so living in a realm of fear just doesn't, doesn't equate with me. Um, uh, I, sure, I have concerns. Obviously, I have concerns. But my concerns are not centered so much around politics, but the, the additional damage that's done to political discourse in this country and how we ever fix it. And, and I would propose to you as American citizens, you have the most power to fix this, and that is to reject the demonization of of people and candidates. When you see someone running nothing but negative ads, run from that person. If you do that, the message will get delivered. Because on November 8th, on November 8th, the, the only people that will be fearful in this country are candidates. And you want to know why they're going to be fearful? Because you have all the power. You have 100% of the power. You are 100% in control of this nation's future on November 9th. So no matter what you believe or feel, go to the polls and vote. And vote for everybody you can that's on that ballot because they've all sacrificed something to get their name there. Vote for somebody. But show up and vote because that's the only way you can really exercise that power. My final question, then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, so I listen to you and you're passionate about uh, what you believe and what you think needs to be done. Uh, could politics ever be a part of your future at some point? That'd be a better question to ask my wife. Um, um, I, I don't think so. I'm 60 years old, um, and so I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I, don't have, I have no plans of reentering the political world. Um, I, uh, I've always viewed this as a season of service. It was, uh, um, it was always my, uh, my policy to, to serve without fear and then leave without regret. And that's what I wanted to do, and to the degree that I've been able to do that, that's what I've done. But surely you have some regrets about not being able to get a few Well, sure, you've got, you've got regrets because you want to yeah. fix more things, right. but this is our political system, and I recognize that. And you're one of 435? I am one of 435. Yeah. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand. We'll uh, go through the process again. If you're in the seat, I'll get to you first. If, if we're in the seating bowl, press down on the rim. If you're in the back, you can wait. Ryan over there with the microphone will come hold the microphone for you. Yes, sir. We'll begin with you. Uh, it seems like a lot of it's apparent a lot of our issues are from the, the two party system. So my question is, do we need a third party in Congress and how would we be able to go about accomplishing that? Yeah. Um, yeah, we do. It's got to be big enough to have some say, because when you go there, let's just say I chose to run as an independent and I win. I'm going to have to choose if I wish to be in any committees to caucus or, or conference with, the Democrats call it caucusing, we call it conferencing, you've got, to, you've got to join one of those two groups so that you can get a committee assignment and actually be effective. 
it's a little different circumstance in the Senate, but in the House, uh, it, would, it would take a fairly significant group of folks. I actually, think, I actually think the core is there for a libertarian party to begin to emerge, because there's about 15 or 16, what I would say, very libertarian-leaning members of Congress right now. And at some point, if they begin to just decide to caucus together and begin to to vote on block on things, they could have some say. But it's got to be a little bit larger. But I can see a future whereby we end up there. Are you going to consider Gary Johnson? Uh, I, I, I'm going to consider Gary. I'm going to consider Evan McMullen. I like both of these mm -hmm. folks. Um, I've known Evan for a few years. Uh, smart, smart guy. Okay. Other questions? Back here. Yeah. Hang on a second. We'll bring the microphone over to you. And if we keep questions brief, we'll get to more of them. Thanks. Uh, just to uh, get back to the Social Security, and with all due respect to the seniors, I've got a few more years before I get there. <laughs> Has there been any discussion regarding means testing? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you and, and I just want to say that in regards to that, we were, my wife and I were recently at a cocktail party, and there was a gentleman there, and he said he's 72. He makes $10,000 a month as spin-off of his investments. But yet when you talk about Social Security, he's like, well, I'm entitled to it. Yeah, but you're making 120 grand a year off of your investments. That money could be used for the, for the other seniors that, aren't, that don't have a portfolio like that. Yeah, good, good question. I apologize for not bringing it. Uh, the fourth section of my bill is on means testing. And uh, what I wanted to do was create a means test that didn't penalize people who, who saved. In other words, this particular person spent a lifetime saving but paying the tax, and so he's saying, I have a right to this. I'm entitled to it. Um, but uh, if we just waved our magic wand and said, well, if you're making 100000 or 200000 500000 whatever it is, in your retirement, we're going to not pay you a benefit, you disincent people from saving when they're high wage earners. So what my bill does is it disincents, uh, it, it incentivizes savings while you're working. So the means test occurs based on your income in your working years. And so we use what's called the third bend point on the PIA to pull that down a little bit. It saves about 10%. And so, yeah, it was a good, good question. I apologize for not including that. Yep. Yep. Uh, a year ago, uh, your friend, Mr. Ryan, replaced John Boehner as speaker. Mm -hmm. Your conference, I think, voted just about unanimously for him. And in fact, they had to do some so I'm persuading to get him in there. And he was brought in at least in part because of his expertise with budgeting. And I think I heard Congressman Ryan last year say things to the effect that finally, after many years of uh, dysfunction on budgeting, this Congress is going to have a budget in place for each of the 12 different departments by September 30, 2016, uh, 12 days ago. What happened is my question. All right, great. that's a great question. Um, I've been in Congress now six years. You're required to pass 12 appropriations bills, they're called, spending bills for each of those departments, 12 per year, that's 72. In the six years that I've been in Congress, zero have gotten to the president's desk. So the budget system doesn't work. I have a bill that would fix it. It's called the Biennial Budgeting and Appropriations Act. Of first it started out in 2011, then 2013, then 2015. I'm in my third Congress. However, my first Congress had about 30 co-sponsors. My second Congress, I had 150 co-sponsors. This Congress, I have 237 co-sponsors. You only need 218 to pass it. What that bill would do is it moves the budget decision to the first quarter of the first year after the election and covers two years, which then opens up more time to get those 12 appropriation bills done. Right now, the majority of the House of Representatives supports this language, the majority. I've not been able to get a markup in the committee. I'm profoundly frustrated in a system that's as badly broken as the one that we have. And so uh, what you could do is write letters to uh, your editor and uh, to uh, your member of Congress demanding a vote for this bill in this next term so we can fix it next year. Here's why it's important. Members of Congress are most courageous the day after their election, most fearful the day before. The budget's the most dangerous vote a person takes, so move it as far away from the election as possible where they're governing from a position of courage. I'll take one more over here, and then we'll move into the rest of the room. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to just comment. I agree with you 100% the way the two current candidates have been treating each other, as well as when the Republicans were running in the campaigns and the 14 or 15 or 60 of them treated each other. 
all except one, and that was John Kasich, who I supported, frankly, and voted for in the Republican primary. Which every single poll showed he would win the general election. <laughs> yeah. And he, was a, he had great experience. He's been in Congress and business and, and, and a good governor, but he couldn't get traction. Do you, what, what happened that he couldn't get the traction? Yeah, I think, I think what happened was you had this populist wing of the party waiting for their champion. Donald Trump saw it and exploited that wing, which was about 20 to 25 percent of the party. Given that there were 15 or 16 other candidates, the other 75 percent of Republicans' votes got diluted, which ultimately then almost became a movement for this one. And, and that's what happened. They ended up eliminating each other on the journey down, down the way. It was, a, it was too big of a field. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure there'll be some autopsy by the, <laughs> by the party afterwards to figure out how to fix that. Other questions? We'll move into this area. Yes, the gentleman in the orange shirt. <clears throat> Hi. I came in a little bit late, but I think I heard a possible contradiction on your part. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that you believe in representative government, uh, which is how the nation started out. But you also said that uh, you couldn't support uh, Donald Trump. Now, in the presidential pre uh, preference election, did uh, Donald Trump receive the majority of votes in your district or not? No, he did not. Okay, then you didn't contradict yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Where am I at? Oh, right here. Right here. <laughs> for your presentation. Um, you're welcome. Your, your values really show forth. I totally agree about the political discourse, discourse in general in our country. And I'm kind of curious to the point of... Um, Veering away from people who negatively campaign, everybody seems to negatively campaign. So what can be done about that? Can, if, if we went to um, publicly funded campaigns exclusively and got rid of that mess with Citizens United, um, could there be some sort of uh, standard that only commercials that highlight a candidate's accomplishments or philosophies or whatever be aired because you know we got rid of cable I, I don't watch a whole lot of these commercials but I see way too many of them as it is thank you yeah yeah I um, appreciate the question um, uh, other countries do exactly what you're saying the problem is we have this uh, document called the, the the Constitution which governs speech in this country um, I, let me give you a, 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 a little different take on Citizens United if I might whether, no matter what your opinion is on Citizens United, this was the underlying principle that the, that the justices ruled on. All public media, not all, but almost all media in this country is owned by big corporate conglomerates, for-profit enterprises. And so General Electric, who owns NBC, had unfettered, unfettered political speech. But me as a roofing contractor had none. What the Supreme Court said is since we have this for-profit media system, to make it fair to all corporations in the country, we can't say that this one has unfettered speech, but this one can have no speech. And so they said, if, we're, if, if this is the case to have a free beat in this country, then I don't care how any business owner chooses to spend their own money in the relationship to speech. That was the underlying legal principle. And, and so you'd have to somehow undo that um, maybe public financing of campaigns would, would certainly level the playing field. Um, I don't know how you would do that in the primary process for challengers. It's difficult. Um, I, I've racked my brain. I'm just not smart enough to, to, to know what the solution is on campaign finance reform. But I do know that the system is broken. Ultimately, however, it was Woodrow Wilson, I believe, that said, if you, if you over-regulate business enterprise in this country, you will forever marry them to Washington, D.C. One of the most progressive presidents in the last hundred plus years. And he was absolutely right. Because now you've given them purpose to come to D.C. to get some relief, whether it's in the tax code or regulatory code or whatever, and the money is just flowing everywhere. If you want less money into that political system, then you must be willing to give up less control. 
And there is that, there is that trade-off that must take place. Other questions? Let me go up there, then I'll come back there, and I'll get here. General go. thoughts on your congressional district's current race? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think if you look at the data, and I've had a chance to see some of the data, um, uh, Thomas Nelson, who's the Outagamie County Executive, I think the <clears throat> former Democrat Majority Leader in the House, um, is running uh, against Republican Mike Gallagher. Um, I think uh, pretty much everybody up there seeing the race uh, as a... Uh, uh, a likely Gallagher win. He was up uh, early polling right after the primary by 16. Uh, he's still up in double digits. So I, I, anticipate, I anticipate that seat uh, going to Gallagher. You that won, you won by how much uh, your first uh, time? Uh, six, points. six points. But I was going against a two-term incumbent, and this is an open seat. Mm -hmm. I was in a non-presidential year, right. presidential year. Right. Yes, sir. So you talked about how you could sometimes get private support for your bill, but then you couldn't get the guys in Congress to come out publicly and say it. And just as they're, you know, looking out for their constituencies across the United States, just as you're looking out for the people of Northeast Wisconsin. So where do you find that balance where you can sometimes, you know, get them to agree, even if it's going to go against perhaps what their constituency believes or what, you know, their issues with getting reelected? Yeah, you know, ultimately getting, getting members of Congress to agree and at least ultimately have the courage to move things forward on difficult things is to begin to show them that the sky doesn't fall. Uh, in fact, sometimes you have to show your staff that because my problem wasn't as much with members of Congress getting on, on like my Social Security bill, was their staff didn't want their member of Congress to get on my Social Security bill. After I introduced the bill, and my staff, by the way, was not thrilled with me whatsoever, I called my entire team into my office and said, I want you to look out this window. I have a nice window in my office. I said, everybody look up and said, the sky did not fall. It's still up there. And, and I believe, I, I think I just believe more in you all than maybe some of my colleagues do. I believe that you want these problems fixed. I believe that you want a government that works for you. I believe that you would like this thing to function correctly. And I've just got infinite faith in the American people. And so that's where I'm at. Got a quick one? I don't always agree with them, but I've got faith. Uh, Two issues. One, is there some reason why people want to retire so early when there is so much to do and they're just getting going? I, I taught 60 years and I was just going in my 80s. Uh, I you mean retire from work in general? People, but the issue, Social Security, it seems, some years back was borrowed from. If there hadn't been money taken for the general fund from Social Security, would we be in the same problem today? Wouldn't it have taken care of itself? Uh, no. Uh, this, is one of the, this is one of the urban legends that have been out there. The, the government has, on occasion, borrowed from the fund and paid the fund back with interest. And, so the, and the interest rates have varied over time from anywhere a low of about 1.25% to 1.5% on the trust fund, as high as 13% on the trust fund. And so over time, this, this, this money gets, gets paid back to the trust fund with its interest board. And so... Um, it's never published. So, I've never seen that published. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, the, yeah, the information's all there. It's a, but these things, they, they, they catch kind of a life of their own. And so um, the trust fund right now has about $2.6 trillion in it. And so, but this last year, we, it went down by $75 billion. So we, we had to cash in bonds that are in the trust fund to pay out that, that gap, you know. And over the next 15, 17 years, as they project losses in the fund, the fund eventually goes down to zero. Remember, Social Security is a transfer payment. You're taking money out of a, a working age American, out of their wallet, and taking that money, transferring it to a retired senior and putting it into their wallet. And with the trust fund larger than the, the payments paying out, they can meet the benefits that have been promised. But if the trust fund goes down to zero, the only money with which to pay benefits are the money that's actually being transferred, which will be 21% less than the need, than the promise. Before we go, a uh, couple of things. Um, tomorrow, we'll be back in this room. We'll be releasing the latest Marquette University Law School poll. So it will look at both the presidential race in Wisconsin, and we'll have the latest numbers from the US Senate race, featuring Ron Johnson and Russ Feingold. I uh, also want to draw your attention to next Tuesday. Um, 
few of our students might be here, but uh, if you're not here, you can watch the Senate debate between uh, Senator Johnson and former Senator Feingold at 8.30. We'll be doing it in this room. I'll be moderating the debate. You can watch it on uh, Channel 12 here in Milwaukee. If you're out of town, you can watch it on an ABC station around the state of Wisconsin. But it'll be live at 8.30 till 10 o'clock, so we encourage you to check that out. Um, as I always say, uh, I really appreciate your interest, uh, your time, the fact that you want to be with us and listen to these kinds of discussions. And I'd also like to say a, a thank you to uh, Congressman Ribble. We really appreciate you being here Good today. to be here. Thank you. Thank you.